Unlike other webcam companies that have been around a long time, Elgato seems to actually be listening to the feedback and complaints about their webcams and making them better. This is the Elgato Facecam Mark II, a refresh of the original face cam that came out a couple years ago that I had a lot of issues with. And it both addresses issues that I had with the original face cam as well as what I had with the face cam pro and combines them into a new 1080p webcam that is still a 1080p webcam. Don't, don't let the hype like convince you it's gonna look like anything else. It is a 1080p webcam, but it might finally be reaching that point of quote unquote perfect for what it is. The Facecam Mark II is a $149.99 refresh of the original Facecam. The original Facecam had one glaring issue other than being a 1080p webcam that I had an issue with. There appears to be a fairly big flicker issue with this camera's sensor. I have been trying it out in any number of scenarios and I've reached the point where I've turned off literally every other light in my studio that I could other than my main key light, which is an Aperture 200X, which is flicker free. It's built for film sets and things like that. And on certain highlights and things like that in the Elgato face cam, you get flickering. Now, every camera of these has noise, although the Razer Keo Pro performs the best in that regard. But the entire like highlight is flickering. It's not just noise throughout. It's like the entire highlight is flickering. This happens on auto mode, although it's more obvious due to everything being brighter on auto mode. This is on manual mode and it's still happening. And I have tons of sample clips that I recorded for Elgato. It's m especially noticeable when you do have background light elements because those highlights end up being what flickers. And I find it insanely, you know, distracting. Not everybody may notice it. It had all sorts of weird exposure flicker throughout the scene that was super distracting and drove me nuts and they never really seemed to find a fix for. Otherwise, it was solid. Uncompressed video for like the first time in a webcam, 1080p 60, manual controls for ISO and white balance and shutter speed in the software, in their camera hub software. It was like almost my dream webcam. Then the Facecam Pro came out and upgraded it to 4K 60. Not that that made a difference with MJPEG encoding and it still being a webcam, but they introduced autofocus. So we lost the flicker and instead gained pretty consistent autofocus pulsing. And even though I've been using this in this setup for quite a few months now, whenever I needed a webcam, I still don't like that about it. I usually set it to manual focus. This one's a refresh of that original face cam. So cheaper than the Mark II, but a 20 bucks more expensive than you can get the Mark I for now. And it introduces some cool stuff. So overall, it is a quality improvement. That is for sure. Like it looks nicer than the original. The original just looked a little too crunchy and a little too whatever compared to this. Like I was fine with it when it released, but compared to the new one, I'm digging the new one a lot. The out of box colors are fantastic, better than the face cam pro, which drives me nuts. Like the original face cam had pretty solid out of box colors. I dug it. I liked it. Face cam pro was a downgrade in that regard. You still had manual control and they actually added my big request for all webcam companies to have both a color temperature and a color tint slider for white balance control. Virtually no other webcam has that. And it's kind of crucial to actually getting your skin tones right. They added this straight off the sensor for the Facecam Pro. The Facecam Mark II does not have manual tint control, just white, uh, just temperature control for white balance. But the out-of-box colors are an even further improvement over last time, which is awesome. It's smaller. They've taken lessons that they learned both from the original and from the Pro. So the shape resembles the Pro a lot more. It's a little shorter, a little easier to manage on your monitors or whatever to fit into things. It, it has vents at the back, which is nice. And then they actually updated the monitor mount to improve upon the original one. This is the original one. It wasn't super great and it kind of stood it off your monitor a little too high in ways that I did not like. The updated one, the updated monitor mount is much more like the Facecam Pros. A lot sleeker, has the screw threaded design for the quarter 20 mount on the bottom. Fits on your monitor a lot easier. And of course it attaches to any of their Elgato multi-mounts or in the prompter. Right now I'm using it with the universal shroud, which it works with just fine, but they do have 3D printable files for a specific prompter backplate for the Facecam Mark II that I actually have going on my 3D printer right now. Lens wise, we're looking at a 24 millimeter equivalent if we're talking in full frame dimensions, F 2.4 lens that provides a fixed focus instead of autofocus. So it's just like the original where there is no autofocus. It won't 
you know, focus if you get super up close, it doesn't pulse. But that also means that you're only in focus in a specific range, which is from 30 centimeters away from the lens to 110 ish centimeters away from the edge lens. And that is about or I think it's away from the sensor, but that is about 43 inches. And with where I have my prompter mounted up right now for like the best angle that I can do at this setup, I am like right on the edge of that. Like I am right on that 40, 43 limit. So that's not a super great range. It's more designed to be optimized for like sitting on top of monitor and you're like right up close to it. But I can't really do that in the setup with all my monitors I have going and stuff. And so I'm right on that edge. Uh, that is, it's a trade-off. I have both praised and kind of shunned fixed focus webcams in the past. I Cannot stand the autofocus pulsing of the Facecam Pro, and so I'm glad that that is gone, and I am mostly in focus. And both between the smaller sensor size compared to some of the newer, bigger sensor webcams and that kind of everything in focus perspective, we're kind of losing a little bit of that perceived depth of field, shallow depth of field look that you might get or something with a webcam here. But it's a webcam. You're using it for a webcam, for video conferencing, for streaming, where it's going to be pretty small. I don't think it's necessary. If you want that shallow depth of field look, just fork out for a mirrorless or something. There are tons of cheap ones on the market at this point. There are two major new features to this camera that are really cool, and they, they go hand in hand. The big one is that it now can capture HDR off the sensor, and not really HDR as in like HDR10 like for gaming or whatever, although you can kind of sort of make that work. It's HDR off the camera sensor, which means double exposure, kind of like how your iPhone or Android phone would do it, in that it takes multiple exposures and averages them together to get better performance in the highlights and the shadows and get a more evenly exposed image, which you may or may not want. Like, I often don't like how my iPhone photos come out because my face is too evenly exposed, and you can kind of see that here. I only have one light hitting me right now, so theoretically I should have some more harsher shadows, but it's doing a great job of evening it out, but I lose a little bit of that skin tone, like, realism with it on. So, you have that there. But it's able to do this at 60 FPS, because it can actually operate at 120 FPS, which is pretty cool. Now compare that to something like the original Razer Keo Pro, which could do HDR, but it could only do it at 1080p 30, because it was sampling at 60 FPS, and thus averaging back down to 30. In this one, we are sampling at... 120 FPS and averaging back down to 60. This also means for that second feature, you could capture your webcam in 720p, 120 FPS if you wanted to record slow-mo replays or something, if that's something you want to do. It's kind of ridiculous for a webcam, but yeah, have the option to do it if you want it. Otherwise, image-wise, I'm not sure you really notice the lower resolution versus the 4K and something like the Elgato Facecam Pro. I'm not sure you're really going to notice. Like, there's not that noticeable of a drop in sharpness compared to it. Like you notice it a little bit in my shirt and in my chair, but in my face, since we're not getting that shallow depth of field and like crucial focus on the eyes and the, and the face and stuff, you don't really notice it that much, which means it's probably fine for most of your uses. Like I could make most of my videos like this. And while it won't be the high tier production value that I get with my 8K mirrorless d camera or something, it would be completely acceptable and fine for most use cases and for those videos if that is what you wanted. I do feel like you notice, as I mentioned, the smaller sensor size compared to the, the Keo Pro Ultra, the Facecam Pro, the Insta360 Link or whatever due to that lack of shallow depth of field. I do want to switch over to the software and show you all of the controls and stuff that you can get in Camera Hub as well as the the different noise reduction and HDR settings. So let's go ahead and flip over and do that. This is what it looks like in Elgato's Camera Hub software. You get full control over the camera to do lots of amazing stuff. And you will notice we are now upgraded from what was effectively a 420 NV12-ish color format coming off of the camera in the original face cam. We now have YUI2 uncompressed, which is 422. Still love to see that. That just means that it's super uncompressed. Um, very high quality, which is great. You're not getting any pre-baked artifacting or something built into the camera feed before it hits your computer. If you're on USB 3, something really cool is that this one actually has USB 2 backwards compatibility. So if you plug it into an older computer, uh, a mobile device, or in this case, for whatever reason, the front USB ports on my Mac are only recognizing the face cam and face cam uh, Mark II as USB 2 connections for some reason. The original face cam did not have the backwards compatibility mode, so it just would not work without USB 3. The new one will. So you can always use it with MJPEG in, in a pinch or if you're using it with a weird configuration. So that is pretty cool. 
So here, we're going to ignore this first section here, but you have controls over contrast, sharpness, and saturation. For my settings here, I dialed up saturation a little bit. If I turn it back down, I feel like the HDR, okay, reset button is not working. Good to know. Oh, it's resetting to what's saved in the camera. That makes sense. So I, oh, this is contrast, sharp, saturation, and sharpness. So I noticed with HDR, I felt like saturation was a little too low. Like this is a very saturated blue shirt. And I just didn't feel like it was quite there. So I turned up saturation just a hair. And then I'm playing around with sharpness because you lose a lot of detail on my beard here compared to what I'm used to. And I don't even care for a ton of sharpness in a video. There's a lot of advantages to not having sharp video. But I feel like this is just really soft. Like everything is just kind of mudded over, which is typical web webcam stuff. This is by no means something exclusive to this one. But I did turn up sharpness just a little bit to try to get a little bit of it out. But also I am losing sharpness because I have noise reduction on, which we will get to in a moment. So that is your standard picture controls, just contrast, color saturation, and sharpness. And then you have exposure. So I have mine on manual because I wanted to fine tune it to get the best image possible. If I turn it on to automatic, you can see here it actually brightens up a fair bit and might look better to you. And if so, that is fine. It's Looking pretty good. You have some options for metering. This is how it determines what the exposure settings are. So by default, it's center weighted, which assumes that you were sitting center frame, which I more or less am, and is going to try to find exposure based on what's in center frame, which is me. That's great. But if you're not sitting center frame or you have more like a group in your shot or something, you can do average, which is going to take it across the whole frame, or you have spot, which you don't get control over where the spot is. I'm going to assume it's just a small spot in the center or like the brightest thing in the frame but I honestly don't know 100% offhand. So I like center weighted because I am in the center and that gives me the best kind of exposure here. The reason I set it to manual is because automatic tends to play with the shutter speed in ways that I don't like. Recording at 60 FPS, you want a minimum of one over 60 shutter speed. Ideally to get the best, most realistic motion blur, you want the 180 degree shutter rule, which means your shutter speed is set to twice your frame rate, which in this case would be 120. But if I do that, it gets way too dark and then we have to crank up ISO and then we get a ton of noise and then the noise reduction takes even more sharpness away and you can see here my LEDs behind my monitor are not really equipped to run at 1 over 120th shutter speed and they start to flicker. So I hit reset to go back to in camera settings because all of these settings do save to memory inside the camera so if you ever take it with you or connect it to another device or whatever or you just reboot you don't have to find your settings again like with a lot of webcams. Now ISO Take with a grain of salt. It's already kind of grain of salty with the webcam anyway, but since we're running with HDR stuff enabled with this dynamic range option, ISO works a little differently because we are sampling at two different ISOs in the first place for those two different exposures. So it works a little differently, but these are the settings that I more or less had for what I think looked good here with high dynamic range set on because I liked how it looked because I've got screens and lights behind me and I got shadowy stuff over here. I felt like it gave me the most even exposure, but we can change this. We can set it back to standard dynamic range and you can immediately see the difference. This is just one exposure. The screen is blown out. The light is blown out and my face now has hot spots because we are actually running too bright now. So this is the brighter exposure that it was sampling. And so I could try my hand at that 120th shutter speed. That's actually working a lot better. And you can see my lights are not flickering. So it was not caused purely by the shutter speed, but by the two different shutter speeds being averaged together. So now we are at that faster shutter speed. We get some smoother motion blur. And then we just got to play with ISO. But you can see here, we got a lot of noise going on in the background. But this is standard dynamic range. So like I still look fine. This is an okay presentable image. But we lose highlights very quickly. And like you saw before, like it's easier to blow my skin out. I think this looks more realistic for my face. Like the skin tone is more right. I've got more variants. Like I've got a little sheen here on my nose. You get the shadows of my lovely eye bags. You get the, the, the where my skin is evenly lit from the light. You get shadows under here. Whereas the high dynamic range mode kind of evened it all out and made it look like the iPhone beauty filter. Like if we set it back to high and auto, I think we're losing sharpness too, because I, I don't know this for certain, but if we can only run the webcam at 120 FPS at 720p, I would imagine the 120 FPS sampling for the double exposure is happening at 720p. So I think we might be losing some resolution here. I could be wrong on that, but I don't know 
why we wouldn't get 1080p 120 if it was capable of doing that. But you can see here, my face, we lose all that variance. It's just like one skin tone and everything's a lot softer in high dynamic range mode. Yeah, we lose, we gain a ton of sharpness here in standard. I'm going to kick it back to standard. Perhaps I should have had it on standard for most of the video, but that's fine. I'm actually going to quickly, we're going to grab my, well, we'll get that in a minute. Yeah, yeah, no, we're going to grab my sample for the comparisons. But that's the dynamic range, is it's basically just taking two exposures and meshing them to get a more evenly distributed image. Not inherently better. If you got a lot of different, like, I mean, it might be important for you for this to look better. Now, I could kick YouTube to dark mode, and that's a little better, but you, you get what I'm saying. You also have white balance. And here it's also set to automatic, and I believe this is center weighted. You see here it gives you a readout of what the color temperature that it's assuming that you're at is set to. So if I turn it back to manual, we can start to fine tune that. But again, we only have color temperature. So like if I set it over here, we got a little bit of a pink tint going on. I can't correct for that off of the image sensor. I can apply a filter, a color grading filter in OBS and correct for that in post. But that only does so much and you start to degrade the image a little bit whereas automatic seems to kind of average both a little bit better but out of box again these colors are wonderful like this is my skin tone more or less no other webcam gets this right and that has always been the case with the face cam then at the bottom you've got noise reduction and anti-flicker anti-flicker is for like your general purpose lights in ntsc or north american regions we got 60 hertz if you're in europe you want pal 50 hertz um, but this is with it off we get the most sharpness the most detail but you get all this grain and noise, which may honestly compress out on YouTube. One of the biggest things during one of my past webcam reviews was a lot of people were really confused why they pulled up the webcam and felt like it was way noisier than it was in my video. And a lot of that is because YouTube and Twitch compresses that out and you don't see it, which means that will happen for you too. So you don't got to worry about it, but it is a little confusing at home versus in the video. And then you have noise reduction. So light honestly doesn't do much at all. Medium starts to take it away, but then we start to get more... We almost get like temporal anti-aliasing where like the details in my beard just start to muddy and ghost together. And then we get high. And that gets rid of it almost completely. But again, we lose a ton of sharpness over it. I honestly like leaving it off. Again, I, I like film grain in my videos, as you all know. And YouTube will compress a lot of it out. I think it's fine. So like this is the setup I would mostly use. I did, while I'm, while I'm poking at this, I did forget to mention one negative side effect of high dynamic range that I wanted to show real quick here. Look at the light in the background here and my screen. You get a lot more weird color noise or flicker in these super saturated lights and stuff. This was the case with the Razer Keo Pro or Keo Pro Ultra, whichever one I was playing around with the HDR with. Super bright in-camera lights just had, oh, you can see it on the arc sign behind me too. Those just have tons of weird issues with these HDR modes. So again, it's not always the correct answer. So if you want my like best settings, so to speak, if you want the least noise, I'm looking at tiny bit saturation and sharpness added, standard dynamic range, auto white balance for me is just always the best, noise reduction off, and then these are my exposure settings based on my light, but your light will be totally different, so you can't really copy those, but I think 1 over 60th is the best for like getting the least noise. If you don't care about the noise because you're going to turn on noise reduction or you don't care about it or whatever, I would use the 1 over 20th shutter speed. I am using an Elgato key light here, and temperature-wise, it is set to about 4,500 Kelvin, and it's about 50% brightness right now. So these are my settings. Then you also have some additional features in Camera Hub that you can use to control your image. So you can zoom in, of course, but it's a 1080p webcam, so you're immediately going to lose tons of information. You can turn on face tracking, which actually does not work for me right now. Because I need the NVIDIA AR SDK. Well, if you have the NVIDIA broadcast tools enabled or installed, you can use that to automatically like track your face around and do all sorts of stuff. And I think they have the eye contact thing, but like I don't mess with any of that. Save it to camera, turn off the preview, and then add it back to OBS. And it winds up looking pretty great. I'm pretty stoked for it. It's a little on the expensive side. 150 bucks for a webcam these days can be a hard buy given how cheaply you can get some mirrorless cameras. You obviously still need a $100 capture card to go with that at that point. So, eh. I think it's a pretty good update. I, it, it blows the, the original face cam out of the water by a long shot. And I think that's the whole point. It is a, a refresh, a replacement for that original face cam. And it gets rid of the flicker. Looks a lot better. And that's about all you could ask for. I think for a 
sub $200 option. That is all you can really hope for. Product links, everything will be in the description down below. I probably have a promo link for Elgato stuff if you want to save a little bit. I think it's down there. I don't really remember. Check out my review of the original face cam or the face cam pro or my webcam reviews playlist to see how it compares to all my different webcams I've reviewed because I could only sample so many in this video. Hope you enjoyed. Go check out my other channels. I'm putting a lot of work into my other channels lately as streaming stuff just ain't as interesting as it used to be. So I'll have those linked below. Remember to be kind. Rewind.